Welcome in to another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young with you here from K-State Online as we get ready to tuck away the Oklahoma State loss for a long, long time and hopefully never have to uh, discuss that or think about something as ugly as what we saw on Friday night ever again. But uh, we do have to give some final thoughts on it before the attention shifts to K-State's matchup this week with Texas Tech. Another road matchup for the Wildcats this time. Uh, they will go to Lubbock, which I guess technically uh, that ends up being their longest road trip this season is the the trip down to Lubbock. Now, it probably won't feel very you know far for them once they, they hop in a, a plane or whatever, but that's definitely the furthest trip that there there will have to be this year. I guess maybe Austin, maybe I'm, I'm not doing enough math, but I think Lubbock's probably further out there. So this is a, this is a big one for K-State to try and bounce back. And unfortunately for them, Texas Tech, not as lifeless as we thought they might be. So K-State's got a lot of things to, to get taken care of here. And uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody, if you've wanted to hear it or get the thoughts by now, you have them from DY, but uh, I'll let you you go here for a second. Uh, what what stands out to you most about maybe not necessarily the game on Friday, but how K State has to bounce back uh, throughout this week and getting ready for Saturday night's game in Lubbock? Yeah, it was an ugly one, and and sometimes you just want to dismiss those and never really look at it again. But I thought it was a little bit more of a crescendo of the flaws that had surfaced here and there in prior contests that they were maybe able to overcome. And instead they all kind of collided and converged together to produce what was a very lackluster performance. And and just, I think the most unsettling thing is probably taking an opponent too lightly, especially one as proud as Oklahoma state. And um, that was certainly going to get up for that game and have their backs against the wall and try to, you know, that was kind of their fork in the road game. Kansas State probably has theirs coming up now. Um, UCF had theirs at KU and lost. I'm trying to think Texas Tech had theirs probably against Houston and won it. Um, so, the, you know, a lot of these teams are having these fork in the road games pretty early. And now just because of what has transpired for Kansas State, theirs is, theirs is next. And I think from a defensive performance Although it wasn't pretty, it wasn't sexy, it was probably enough. And in the plan was not pretty, it was not sexy, but it was probably the right one just because I mean, I know they played conservative, give up a ton of cushion, and and because of that, give up a lot of yards. But I think they knew that the only way that Oklahoma State was going to have their offense win that game was with explosive play. So play back and just prevent those in. They had a few long runs in there, around 30-plus yard runs in there. But for the most part, I thought they executed that plan because then you come crashing down in the red zone and, and you hold them to field goals and you only give up one offensive touchdown and you probably have done your job at that point. I mean, if you take away some of the offense's mistakes, the defense will give up 19 points and on 11 drives. So you'll, you'll take that. And, yeah, I some of the – I know, folks, it's not a sexy way to to play defense just to kind of play bend but don't break. But that plan was probably the right one, especially for a Kansas State team that has been vulnerable to the big play. You don't want to get beat over the top like you've been beat over the top so many times this year and without your two best corners. So I, strategically speaking, I think that was probably the right move um, to – give up the underneath stuff offensively. uh, That's where you probably have a lot more issues and a lot more concerns moving forward that, you know, emanate from the passing game more than anything, whether it's not getting enough protection, snapping the ball 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage receivers, not getting open, um, not playing clean football on the outside, the receivers that probably need to do more, a quarterback that's staring down his receivers and throwing interceptions, even though two of the three interception interceptions are probably have the same culprit. And that's really look the, the passing game is complex. Uh, they're running a lot of option and choice routes because that can make you more dangerous as an offense. And they felt like they had a graduated enough understanding to execute that, but they aren't because that also requires your quarterbacks and your receivers to be on the same page. And they aren't, they aren't making the same read. So someone's making 
the right read and someone isn't on a few of these interceptions. And, and obviously we don't have all the answers to say who's making the right read and who isn't. Will Howard's not playing good enough football right now, but he's far from the only problem. Yeah. I, I think that's probably one of the toughest things right now is you look around and it, you know, it would be honestly a lot easier for K state probably if you could point the finger and say, okay, you know, Will Howard is the the problem offensively and why this thing is struggling, but that's just it's not it's not the case uh, for K State. They can't do that because you can look around and you can say, all right, well, you know, the offensive line had their share of struggles again uh, in the game on Friday night. I mean, the, the highlight was obviously the Hayden Gillum sack, but you know, on one of the the picks that that Howard threw, it was a three man rush. O State was bringing and. There was zero resistance given on the edge, and there was a guy in his face immediately. K State was down. You know, you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole. It, you're kind of in a, a tough spot there if you're Will Howard. You feel like, hey, I can't take this sack right here. I can't get hit. We got to try and make a play. And unfortunately, something bad happens. But um, you you also have to look at the receivers. They have done zero in the playmaking department against an opponent that has mattered this year. They've been really good against SEMO and Troy, two teams that they are miles better than because of just, you know, Power 5 versus G5 or FCS dynamic there. But we haven't seen much out of these guys against Missouri, against UCF, and now against Oklahoma State, and they're definitely a problem. There is an effort problem there that, that can easily be seen at times with how things have worked out. This just this is an offense that has a lot of questions it has to ask of itself right now. And I mean, the longer we get into this, K-State will hit the halfway point of the season after Friday night's game in Lubbock. They're going to have to start to ask themselves if you know they can actually answer these questions. Like, do they have the guys that can be honest with themselves? Can they can they step up and make something happen? And I I don't know. Right now it seems like they've got a handful of guys that don't really want to take responsibility and step up. And the, the only way you can prove that is by going out and doing some of these things differently, playing better helps looking like you care and you have a little bit more effort and energy that also helps. Uh, it's, it was a, it was a bad, bad game for K state in a lot of areas, not just from the outcome, but also the way it looked and getting to that outcome. Because even though I think Oklahoma state, that's probably one of the better games they are going to play this year and what they were able to do successfully, uh, that's they still should not have been able to do that to you. And you should have been able to do more to them if you're K-State. I mean, you talked about the defense. They, You're right. They were not the problem on Friday night. I mean, they gave up one touchdown. We know K-State's offense is supposed to be the bread and butter here. But Chris Kleiman is right when he says, hey, those guys have to be forcing turnovers too. That is the truth. And you specifically need to be able to do it against a guy like Alan Bowman who, again, has never been good in the Big 12 at quarterback outside of Texas Tech thinking he was the guy but getting hurt every other game. Alan Bowman is nothing special, and you weren't able to get anything off of him. I mean, he his incompletions ended up piling up pretty good, but no turnovers were forced on him after he threw two against Iowa State. You know, the defensive ends were not able to get enough pressure. K-State had zero sacks in the game on uh, Friday night, just – all around a uh, not very good showing for the defense, but they were able to patch it together. And when it mattered most, keep Oklahoma State out of the end zone. And that ultimately gave K-State a chance to win that game or have an opportunity to at least force overtime. And the offense, just same story, had opportunities against Missouri, did not take them, had opportunities against UCF, didn't take them until the very end. And then here against Oklahoma State, again, the opportunities presented themselves and they weren't able to rise to the occasion. Missed opportunities kind of been a theme for the offense throughout the season. And and now you're getting to a point where teams know who you are, can find your tendencies and your flaws a little bit more because of the larger sampler size. And they're going to scheme that up moving forward. So it's not going to be any easier. It's going to get harder. Um, teams are going to force Kansas State receivers just to win man coverage because at this point they haven't proved that they can do it. Yeah, and it, it seems unlikely that they are going to be able to do it, at least for what we've seen. I mean, the, the hope would continue to be that maybe at some point Keegan Johnson 
busts out like you know the expectation and the thought was at the start of the season. But the longer it goes without that happening, the less likely it becomes. I mean, he only caught two balls uh, on on Friday night, which is about, not what you would have expected. And some of it, I think, is just like I, I, I no, he got hurt after one of them, so I yeah. get it. But uh, I, I think they got to really spotlight him more, give him more of an opportunity. I, I think for a while it was maybe health related, but I think we're beyond that point. Other than that little hiccup during the Oklahoma State game, now I think we're at a point where it's like he's our weapon. He's going to be on the field, and he's the one we were going to rely on to to stretch the field. Even if we have to like force feed it a little bit, I think that's you got to scheme that. You, you got to make him more of a part of the game plan, in my opinion. Well, and you obviously don't lose anything by doing that either because you, you already lost the game to Oklahoma State. Like, no, things aren't working anyways. If if your game plan is to try something different by getting Keegan Johnson more involved, well, nothing's going to change for the worse because you're already kind of at rock bottom with how everything's played out. So we'll see how it ultimately ends up working out from that point and uh, kind of go on from there. Uh, one other thing from, from Friday night's game that, obviously was a a big deal uh was the the no show of Avery Johnson he didn't get into the game uh and Chris Kleiman said that there were discussions about it what what did you make of Avery Johnson not getting in and then also uh, how Chris Kleiman addressed it after the game him not getting in just be, and more so because he did against Missouri and then not after it's just a little confusing, like that you're – like their plans are so game-dependent, and I know it's tough with the two-quarterback system. I mean, if you don't execute it right, people are going to be down your throat for even thinking about doing it too, right? Mm -hmm. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. But Saturday it was probably a scenario, scenario where I – there was little to lose by giving him a chance. So that's what I will say. And I, and I just think that the fact that you can use them against Missouri, but not in a situation like Saturday at Oklahoma State when things really aren't going your way and you're turning the ball over anyway, like why that's not not a uh, – Well, and – That you're willing to take. And, and then based on after the game, Chris Klein being so willing to, to admit and reveal that it was being considered probably says a lot about – his frustrations with the offense in general at this point. Well, my, my takeaway, and I said this on the Sunday show, so I won't, you know, go all the way into it. Cause I'm sure people have already heard it and I don't need to repeat it, but uh, the, the re one of the reasons that Chris Kleiman gave was like, Hey, yeah, there were like some cadence issues and all this stuff because of the crowd and blah, blah, blah. That's fine. I guess I get that, but I did just see a fifth year senior and a fourth year senior snap a ball 20 yards past that quarterback earlier in the game. Like Hayden Gillum and Will Howard already had their own issue with that. Uh, if that's going to be the outcome, like I, there were just so many things that went wrong for K-State on Friday that I don't know how Avery Johnson could have gone in there and made things worse based off how a lot of the, the game had played out. Now, if you got to the point where you thought, hey, we thought Will kind of found a rhythm there at one point because it did seem like the offense had a little moment, a little flash, that's fine, but when things were really struggling early on in that game and then at other various points in the second half, I, I don't think you lose anything by throwing him out there. So uh, we'll probably have to see how things go. I mean, I'll just pose this question to you. Since Texas Tech is the next team on the docket, do you think because there was this conversation and some questioning about it after the, the Oklahoma State game that we see Avery Johnson regardless on Saturday night in Lubbock? I don't think we see him regardless because of that. I think we see him regardless because they need a spark and some explosiveness to their offense, and he's certainly someone that can apply it. So I think I would say he plays because of that. I would also say that the leash is shorter because of that, what mm -hmm. you referred to, though. Because if you're considering it at Oklahoma State and things start to really unfold in a negative way against Texas Tech, I mean, that could be your season or at least your – maintenance of hope when it comes mm -hmm. to maybe a potential chance to return to Arlington. 
you're not going to do that if you lose to Texas Tech, who is really in the same spot as you, except feeling better about themselves now that they defeated Houston and Baylor and did it in convincing fashion. So this is, look, every game the rest of the way is a fork in the road game for Texas Tech because they already have three losses and their next one's their fourth. But this is the, the first one of its kind this year for Kansas State because you fall one and two and you're not feeling good about yourself and you're asking questions about the offense. You're asking questions about who should be starting a quarterback and you still have Texas to play. Like it, it, it's hard to squint and feel good about the season if you were to lose and fall to under 500 in Big 12 play at this point of the year with what still remains. All the, you'll win it. Now you are two and mm-hmm. one. You can squint and still see that route to Arlington controlling your own destiny, yeah. so to speak, because you still get Texas and you're coming back for two home games that yeah. should be very winnable against TCU and Houston. Yeah. All right. Well, I asked this to Drew and, uh, and fan yesterday as well, but I'll ask it of you. So we, we get you on the record and, 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 you know, another opinion into the ring here. I mean, what, what is the leash for Will Howard? If you were Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein, what is the leash for Will Howard? And how do you handle deciding, okay, this, this is not working for whatever reason. And last year was last year. It's time to do this. How do you handle that? And and when do you know, hey, this is the time that yeah. we either have to go with a heavy dose of Avery Johnson or we just have to say, screw it, like Avery's getting this thing now. Yeah, it's tough because you also don't want your quarterback looking over his shoulder because that can dictate an altered performance too. And unfortunately, there's probably no other way around that. So it's put up or shut up time. Look, it, it's probably – you, I don't know if you can go into it and saying if this happens, we do this, and if that doesn't happen, we do that. That that's tough. It's probably going to be a game field thing. Some of it's going to depend on what Texas Tech is doing offensively and how much mm-hmm. margin for error you do have. Right? I think that has to go into the equation because, look, I would say if it's a like a multiple turnover first quarter, I think that kind of answers it for you a little bit. Um. If, if assuming the terms would be Will Howard centric, I, I think it, like if he goes and throws two interceptions in the first quarter in Lubbock, I I, th- I think you you have to take a long hard look in the mirror. I also think you, just for the the sanity of the team, the offense, uh, I I think you have to have at least one scoring drive in the first quarter um, to to feel good about it. Mm-hmm. So. I would take a quarter by quarter. Uh, okay. Well, one one other thing before we get to our over and unders and, and kind of recap uh, how that went from the game. We talked about receiver being an issue. Is there anything K State can do right now at receiver to make themselves better or to make it easier on Will Howard or Avery Johnson if he ends up in the game? Because right now, I think that would be one of the only concerns is that hey, the receivers aren't doing a lot for Will Howard, so. That's probably not the best thing to give a true freshman uh, if if he yeah. doesn't have the receiving core to work with. I mean, is it something where y- you need to try? I know, I know. If they were doing well, they'd be out there right now because it's not like it's tough to to move past the guys in front of them. But is that something where a guy like Trey Spivey just needs to be thrown into more game actions and get an opportunity to take a job and run with it? Because a lot of the other guys that have been out there, they really haven't so far this year. One is receivers got to be tough. They got to show a little bit of toughness too, and be willing to, to go through some things and through some adversity without just you know. I'm not, you got to you got to. So th- that's my opinion. I, I think that room needs to exude a little bit more toughness in general. Second, some of the issue, a lot of the issue, a reoccurring problem anyway, an issue that hasn't gone away, is the lack of chemistry and cohesion in terms of reading coverages between Will Howard and his receivers. So if you can't execute those option and choice routes because you can't choose which one of the two to do as a unit and be on the same page, like Will Howard does one route, the receiver runs another. That's not just, all oh, Will threw the wrong route. That's not just, hey, the receiver ran the wrong route. Those are choice and option routes. It makes the offense harder to defend when well executed because you're basically running a route that is dictated by what the defense gives you coverage-wise, what kind of look that you are getting. When the quarterback and receiver aren't reading those together correctly, it goes really bad. And that's what we're seeing this year. Two of the three interceptions against Oklahoma State were 
That was the culprit. So that's why I think Chris Kleiman mentioned, I think multiple times in the post game press conference about simplifying the offense. Like, Hey, if you guys can't execute this very complex form of where the quarterback and receivers kind of the read each other's mind and do what each other's thinking, then we'll go back to simplifying. This is the route you run. There's no other option. Now it makes you maybe a little bit easier to defend because you're not adjusting on the fly and, and taking what the defense gives you. You're going to run the route, even if the defense has a blanket. In it. So not an ideal situation there regardless. So, but maybe that fixes it at least short term. Well, secondly, secondly, I would say is that I do think they need to like rep a lot because for all this lack of chemistry and cohesion, it's like, are these guys practicing together? Are they playing together? You have had, you've had this revolving door of injuries a little bit where I bet practice time has been affected. So does Will Howard have enough reps with these guys throughout the the season so far to be on the same page? If not, like, man, I'd be out there doing it extra every day um, to ensure that that happens. And you put maybe a little fear of, you know, losing your job in there. Uh, it could be a really good motivator or you find someone that deserves to play as well. All those things I think are, are coming into play for me. And at the end of the day too, if you're, if you got a wide receiver unit that in general can't beat jams at the line of scrimmage or really tight man coverage and Colin Klein has to, you know, scheme up some things and give some free releases there and, and scheme some guys open too, which I thought he started to do, you know, in the second half after he made some adjustments probably needs to be a little sooner, but you got to help your guys out a little bit too. Well, and I think in terms of simplifying it and, you know, having to kind of dumb it down a little bit and just get it back to more of a, like, Hey, look, I'm, I'm the, I'm the leader here. You listen to me as opposed to this is a, this is kind of a, a partnership. Like I'm going to give, you're going to give a little bit. Um, I, if you're Colin Klein and you're running this offense, the guys that are catching the balls this year, they're not Malik Knowles and Cade Warner, guys that have played college football for a long time. And obviously in Knowles had the size and the talent to do a lot of the things. And obviously there was a connection there with Will Howard. And then Cade Warner, who is, you know, he, it doesn't make sense to how a guy that looks like him was able to be so much of a, a weapon last year but that's what he became. And it's probably because he's, you know, he, he knows the game of football better than a lot of people given, you know, who his dad is. And so you don't have that in the guys that are playing receiver right now. You have guys that have minimal on field experience. And then Phillip Brooks, who is what he is as a receiver, where he's mostly reliable if you throw the ball his way, but he's not a deep threat guy. And that's one of the, it's one of the other issues we've seen this year is it's, you can't get it through Will Howard's head that, Throwing the deep ball down the middle of the field with Phillip Brooks probably is a bad, bad, bad idea. Uh, there's just – he's 5'8". He's not going to be able to go up and get that ball for you. It needs to be in Phillip Brooks's chest or he needs loads of separation because it's not Phillip Brooks's fault, you know. And, like, it's just physically he cannot compete against some of the positions that he gets into uh, and what Will Howard tries to throw the ball to him with. So – I don't know that that's one other thing that I think will be interesting to watch on on Saturday night against Texas Tech because clearly that's another area that K State needs some serious improvement and to to get better on in a hurry. Uh, one, quick, one yeah. thing, I I you bring up a good point with Kay Warner and all that too, and I actually brought him up on our three mile podcast that will soon be released as well. And I would say this that there are some things that have gone up that have. Uh, that has happened on the field from wide receivers where I don't think takes place if Kate Warner's in that locker room or in that mm -hmm. wide receiver room because he's ripping someone's ass or he's doing everything in his power um, where you can't get away with some of the things that have gone on. Uh, Kate Warner wouldn't have let it happen. And I, I think Seth Porter is a great leader, but it, it's hard to lead. Yes. If you're not if you're not regularly on the field, but he's another one guy like that, too. But for the guys that are on that are on the field on a regular basis, um, the leadership has to be much better because some of that stuff can't go on.
Absolutely. I mean, that's that is something that I brought up yesterday on the Sunday show with with Fan and Drew was. I mean, you look at last year, and I this is kind of what I was getting at when I asked Chris Kleiman if the team was missing anything emotionally or philosophically from last year's team. Obviously, we know that you lost really talented players from last year's team. But what you also lost were guys that had played for a while, and I think a handful of guys that took a lot of ownership with this team and were not afraid to, to use their voice and could be looked up to. But now you look around this year, you have a bunch of guys that they're either in this position for the first time or they're just, it doesn't seem like they're, you know, natural born leaders. I mean, the, the problem for Will Howard is this you have a guy that's in his fourth year at K State and he is your quarterback. He is supposed to be your leader. The other three years here, he's been the backup quarterback. And I know that he ended up starting games at various points in all three of those years, but the mentality going into it is he was the backup quarterback. I mean, Obviously, the first two years, it was clearly Skylar Thompson's team. Then Adrian Martinez comes in. He's still the backup. He obviously had not played well. He's having to learn and just kind of wait and, and you know, let, let Adrian use his experiences and help you lead and, and everybody else that's involved. But now this is your team. It's just he doesn't have experience in how to do that necessarily. And then you look around. I mean, you're right on Cade Warner. I think defensively, you take a peek. At, it's just it's tough now because – Austin Moore, I think, is a great player, and he's a dude that probably leads by example. But Austin Moore has never struck me as a very vocal guy, and a guy that you know when it's when it's time to get well, down. To I, I think that one would surprise you. I think that one would surprise you. Like I imagine Austin Moore is the guy that's going to like for the defense and for the team in general moving forward. That because he was the most he was disgusted. I mean, he, he was pissed off. There, that's for sure. He was disgusted afterwards. So I'd imagine like Austin Moore is on a freaking rampage this week. Like, cause that struck me as a guy that as soon as he left that room where he showed off, showed how pissed off and disgusted he was, that he was going to be on a rampage for the next five days to make sure everyone's ready to, you know, kick some ass against Texas Tech on Saturday. No. So I, I, I don't get the sense from that from Austin Moore, but in general, offensively, someone's got to take, take, take the mammal too. You know, and I think Will Howard can do that. He's a pretty good leader, but man, you, sometimes you need it in position rooms you know, mm -hmm. for guys that are playing. And I just don't get the sense that there's a whole lot of that at wide yeah. receiver because some of the stuff that's gone on just wouldn't be acceptable otherwise. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. I guess my my thought on Austin Moore, he was clearly upset, but I think even then he he still he internalized a lot of it and kept himself pretty calm, but. I think it's probably that type of dude that if things continue to go the way they are, it will bubble over and he will finally lose it. And I think that's probably what this team needs right now. I think that this is a team that they need one of these guys that can be a leader and that is talented to just, you know, flip a lid on, on the team because I, it's just, you know, it, it's one thing if it's a bad team, like you weren't around for it, but the 2015 K state team, that team, I mean, you could have given all the pissed off motivational speeches in the world and it wouldn't have mattered. It, honestly, I would have laughed at you. It would have been silly because that team was not talented enough to be anything more than six and six. They, I mean, they were lucky to be six and six given the circumstances of that season. Um, so like that's a little bit different. But this team has still has too much talent and too many guys that are good enough to be better than what they are right now. Um, and, you know, if they were three and two in a different way and they had played some different teams, we're probably not talking about them like this. The problem is you just went and lost to an Oklahoma State team that, I mean, the three of us at KSO, we consensus thought that they were the worst team in the Big 12 going into last week. They were terrible defending the pass. They defended the pass to an exemplary level. And then on top of that, you know, you weren't able to do anything defensively early on in a drive to either force a turnover or force them to stall. So you gave a lot of opportunities there for a bad team to beat you. And obviously Oklahoma state took it. So we'll see what it looks like uh, this week uh, against, uh, against Texas tech. All right, real quick, let's recap uh, the game one final time with our overs and unders. Uh, Drew set all these lines for us last week. We went through and we went over them at the start of the week. You had a one game lead on Drew and I, D.Y. You were 16 and 7 on the season. Drew and I were 15 and 8. 
We all took the over on Keegan Johnson catches at two and a half. He only had two. Talked about that a little bit. You're of the opinion you just have to to get him more involved early on and give him the opportunity early as opposed to trying to ease him into anything. Yeah, I, I just think that he needs to be a central part of the game plan. That's all. I yeah. don't, I, it's hard for me to, I guess, verbalize it any other way. I Like, I think he's to a point where he's probably getting healthy enough to do it, and now you just kind of have to – say you have to give him an opportunity because yeah. when you're throwing it to him, it's going well. Now maybe he has to get open. Maybe you have to True. scheme him to get open. I don't know what all is going into it, but th- some way, somehow he's on the field, get on the ball. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. When Keegan Johnson has touched the ball this year, good things have happened. I mean, you can go and, and, and we can look at it right now, but he has eight catches and you know, he's, he's, He's been productive with all of those and tried to make things happen. So we'll see if uh, they they try that on Saturday night. All right, K State sacks three and a half. We all took the over. They didn't get a single one. Uh, Oklahoma State had given up a lot of pressure to teams not named, uh, you know, like Central Arkansas and and whatever. When they played, even you know, a reasonable opponent, they were giving up pressure, and K State wasn't able to get a single sack. I mean. What did you make of how the the defensive front performed on Friday night and, and why that number ended up being a goose egg? They have to be better, but I do think it was a product of the plan too because, I mean, they didn't send as much pressure. They were very content with making Oklahoma State string along drives and finish with touchdowns, and they couldn't do it. So technically I thought the plan was effective. Um, but it wasn't conducive to really a big havoc game up front. Although still seven tackles for loss, so it means they were doing something well in the, the, and, the run, game, run game. You know, Alan Bowman, it, it was clear that for him, the goal for Oklahoma State was, hey, you're either getting that ball out really quick, you know, and it, it's not traveling more than three yards in the air or something, or he was just winding up and throwing it as far as he could, and sometimes it would work out. So. Uh, we all miss on that one. DJ Giddens carries 17 and a half. Uh, all three of us took the under there. Giddens ended up with 16 carries in the game. Uh, the total ends up being uh, 65 yards on the ground for DJ Giddens. Trayshawn Ward got nine carries for 59 yards. Uh, what did you make of the running backs on Friday night? Because, it, I mean, they didn't do anything to stand out, but also they take really zero blame in the outcome on Friday night because everything else offensively was the real problem, quarterback, wide receiver, offensive line. But you may feel differently. Yeah, I mean, Trayshawn Ward looked fresh, looked pretty solid. DJ Giddens had a slow start, but then kind of got going later. I think you would have liked to probably, with the way, you know, this is hindsight, you probably would have liked to maybe establish the run game a little bit more. But when you get down, what was it, 26-7, it's hard to do that. Yeah, that the avalanche of getting down so like in the second quarter it just came on and and it happened so quick like you just you, you had no room you had to come out throwing it and the game plan had to have been to throw it like we said it should have been because Oklahoma State was terrible against the pass they just defended it really well against K State over the weekend. Uh, Desmond Purnell tackles five and a half. You and Drew both took the over. I was the only one to take the under. Uh, he ended up totaling just two tackles in the entire game. One of them was a, a half tackle for loss. Um, I mean, what what did you make of not just Desmond Purnell, but the linebackers in particular? Because we know that obviously Daniel Green and Asa Newsom are gone for the year. We're getting more Bo Palmer. Jake Clifton had an extra week to kind of rest up to get back from his injury. Austin Romaine kind of growing into this role now. Uh, what did you take away from the linebackers on Friday night? So, like, I have a hard time really criticizing the defense. Like, they had a plan and they executed it. It wasn't a sexy play and people were pissed off about it because of all the cushion. But they were going to make Oklahoma State string along drives because they didn't think they could do it uh, and still finish in the end zone. And they were right. Oklahoma State couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, All right. The final one, Will Howard rushing yards, 26 and a half. Drew and I took the over. You took the under. Let me read what you wrote about the under because I think it's very telling about the situation that unfolded on Friday night. Yeah. You said, you said, part of my answer is to be different than Drew, 
but it really could be a game where Howard just remains in the pocket. I'm not sure Kansas State needs the quarterback run game in Stillwater, and if they do, maybe it's from Avery Johnson. Well, obviously they needed it, and they got it from Will Howard, but we still ended up talking about how Avery Johnson probably needed to see some time in that game. Uh, and real quick, I'll add in what I said. Um, I said, you know, the quarterback run will be schemed in the game in some way for Howard, but also expect one player or two in the passing game to fall away of Howard scrambling for a decent chunk. Really, it was more the design runs that worked out for Will Howard in the game, obviously the big 70 yarder. Um, so, I mean, what you can, you can share your thoughts on the, the takeaway there. They needed it more. We thought they were, would go into because the passing game sucked. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly right. I, there's no better way to sum it up than that. It was bad. It was really, really bad. Uh, and we'll see, I mean, I'll, we'll have grades out today, uh, on the game for myself and everybody can, you know, pick those apart and see, but they're, they're not the friendliest of grades, uh, this week as they really shouldn't be. It was not a pretty game. Uh, we'll get, we'll close things out. We'll get your thoughts real quick on what transpired outside of K-State and Oklahoma State in the Big 12 this weekend. Obviously, the big one was Oklahoma taking down Texas in the final minute. Texas Tech got on track against Baylor. TCU never really seemed competitive against Iowa State. Plus, they lost Chandler Morris with a knee injury, so we'll have to see how long he's out. And then KU dominated UCF after John Rice Plumley got like three plays and then re-aggravated his knee injury and left the game and never came back. Uh, and also... UCS run defense is horrendous. So uh, what what were the takeaways from the Big 12 this weekend? Oklahoma's got the clearest path to Arlington after defeating Texas just because their schedule is pretty simple otherwise. Texas still controls their own destiny, and I think that, I mean, they'll be favored in every game the rest of the way. So it'll be a Red River Big 12 title game unless Texas stubs their toe, unless Oklahoma stubs their toe. Other, but, I mean, Oklahoma has less reason to stub their toe. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just because their schedule is so much simpler. I mean, Texas still has a a couple. They have more roadblocks, even if they're not roadblocks hurdles than than Oklahoma does. So Texas still has yeah. a, a more challenging path. UCF, whew, you you lose like that, and you're sitting there zero and three in the Big Twelve. It's it's hard. For them to come back. That was their fork in the road game. I talked about these. A lot of these teams, because they have you know bigger goals, have, have had these fo fork in the road games earlier on. That was the fork in the road game for Oklahoma State. I said their backs are against the wall. They can go one of two ways, a win, and they can probably get enough confidence to where, hey, we can win six to seven games this year. And and it's on the table for them to do so because they also have a, a very forgiving Big 12 schedule. Now, UCF, it was the same thing, but they got blown out on the road by 30. And Sunflower State has been yeah. not kind to the Knights. And now you wonder if UCF is going to even be bowl eligible. Texas Tech, they had every game, probably a fork in the road game for them because they lost three of their first, what, four or five games. Mm -hmm. And now yeah, you're, I mean, they smashed Houston. They smashed Baylor, right? So yep. they're playing their best football. And you can kind of like now look in, in hindsight and be like, man, Oregon's pretty good. Maybe the best team in the country. And Wyoming might be the group of five representative in a, in a, in a New Year's Six Bowl. So yeah. maybe what they did was forgiving. And then West Virginia still hasn't lost a Big 12 game. So yeah. Texas Tech maybe was, like I said, even at the time, just a you know unfortunate bearer of a really tricky beginning schedule. And, and then, Real quick, in theory, West Virginia, they should probably be 3-0 and in the Big 12 after this week because they have Houston on Thursday night. So West Virginia is going to be a third of the way through their conference schedule and be tied for first place. Yeah, although, you know, tricky game. I, I wonder if Houston wins that. Um, wouldn't surprise me at, at all, uh, to be quite honest. And then lastly, like UCF, you kind of wonder where TCU goes from here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're in a a tricky situation where they only, they already have three losses as well. Uh, I believe they've lost yep, to Colorado, three three, yep. lost to Colorado, lost to West Virginia at home and then going really got their ass kicked by Iowa mm -hmm. state and Ames and weren't that competitive uh, 13 point loss. It probably felt even more than that. If, if you watch the game start to finish. So there's, there's some teams there that you wonder where they go from here. And two of those are TCU and UCF because they could easily, really 
nosedive. Those two could. And the loser of Kansas State, Texas Tech, quite frankly, might be in a similar spot because if Texas Tech loses, it's their fourth loss of the season already. Yeah. If Kansas State loses, they're one and two in a Big 12. But because I this is why it's a fork in the road game, they could also come out with a huge road win over a team that's pretty solid in Texas Tech feel better about themselves and have two very winnable games at home coming up to where they could stretch their record to four and one before they get to a trickier part. So big fork in the road game for Kansas state, probably the same for Texas tech. And unfortunately for Kansas state, look, people hate me saying this, but I really believe in the anatomy of a schedule. Like Kansas state got Missouri who really wanted to beat them badly because of what happened last year. And, and they were able to, get Kansas State at a point in their schedule that was pretty favorable to them, and Missouri was the home team. Same thing happened at Oklahoma State. It was a fork and road game. Oklahoma State wanted to pay back from last year, getting their ass kicked in Manhattan 48-0. to You got it a Friday night, big crowd, sellout crowd. Oklahoma State backs against the wall off a of bye week. Perfect situation for Oklahoma State to pull that upset. And quite frankly, similar spot here, Texas Tech, finally get, starting to feel good about themselves. You can kind of explain away the beginning – part of their schedule, starting to play their best football. Bear Morton, more experience under his belt. Two great wins. Now the crowd is back invested in the program. Sees a path to maybe still get to Arlington and everything that they thought that they were going to accomplish before the season, they can still accomplish. So Texas Tech, well invested in the season. So Kansas State, through no fault of their own, and this is not to excuse away a potential loss, but they're getting some of these teams at, at, the, at a bad time. Yeah, no, that that is that is true. I mean, obviously, Mizzou and Oklahoma State had all the motivation in the world uh, in those games, and I mean, I, I'll, I'll also throw this and out Texas here. Hasn't beaten Kansas State in like a decade, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I I would have to think. I mean, they K State has not lost to Texas Tech for sure since 2011. So I don't know if they played each other in 2010. Uh, oh wait, no, they they did lose one of those games there, I think. But you're it's getting close to a decade. I think they did lose in like thir- uh, thirteen or fourteen, fifteen type deal. Um, they they lost a bad one in there somewhere. But they've owned Texas Tech for a long time now, uh, and and Texas Tech obviously could have gotten them in Manhattan last year if you you think about it. Real quick, I'll throw this in here. You know, you talk and, about the anatomy of a schedule. Um, <laughs> And, and how things have kind of played out. Uh, yeah, K-State lost the, the game to Texas Tech uh, in, in 2015, 59-44 to 44 in Lubbock. But outside of that, K-State has only lost that one time since 2011. Um, anatomy of a schedule. Friday night, early on in that game, uh, I got a text from from one of my friends who, you know, he, he went to Arizona State, so he's a big Pac-12 guy. And he says... He's like, oh, I forgot that the Big 12 is scheduling these Pac-12 games now where they're making their good teams go on the road on on Friday nights. He's like, this is just like a Pac-12 game. He's like, K-State is going to lose this game because the schedule is just dumb. And, 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 and you know, that's probably silly to think that way, but it is weird how that typically works out where you put a good team on the road and in a different situation, it's just unfortunate. And it's just one other reason why – things can be a little off for them. Um, and then another thing on Texas Tech, they have to win one of these three games against K-State, at KU, at Texas to get to 6-6 six and six this year. Um, that that There's no if and or buts about that because those are their three toughest games remaining. Those are three teams that going into last week, we would have said those three teams are better than Texas Tech right now. Um, and Honestly, with the road matchups, I at KU and at Texas, they will be underdogs in as it currently stands, I would imagine. So they have to get this game against K-State probably to feel good about being a bowl-eligible team uh, the rest of the way. Because if they lose, then it's going to be tough to get to that number. And what I will say, too, is that under Joey McGuire, Texas Tech has been 100 times better at home than on the road. Um, yeah. it's like a, a night and day type type of thing. Now they probably feel a little bit better about that. It felt, probably felt like they cleared a hurdle by winning in Waco though. Yeah, that's true. So I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll have to see how this, this all ends up playing out and, and the way it goes, we'll talk more about this weekend in the big 12, uh, as it comes this week. 
But uh, that will do it for us on this Monday edition of the KSO Show. We will be back on Wednesday morning to recap what Chris Kleiman had to say at his weekly press conference, get some of the sound from that, and also break down what those words meant exactly and preview the game with Texas Tech a little bit more. If you want more great K-State content, make sure that you're joining us over on On3 with K-State Online and everything that we have going there, as well as following along with the YouTube and podcast platforms. And to get your, your extra dose of DY, be sure to be checking out the 3 Maw podcast as well. That way you're getting K-State content every single minute of the day. You, you can go basically sun up to sundown with K-State content, even though you may want to try and avoid it after this week with the lost Oklahoma State. I know everybody's still kind of craving the, you know, they, they want to hear bad things said because it's a cathartic experience for everybody. So uh, get that all out on the foundation over on the message boards. Join everybody else over there. Although I think they're all taking out their frustration on me now by saying that I'm an idiot for my prior takes on Brock Purdy, who did carve up the the Cowboys last night. Uh, and I look, I was, I'll admit that I was wrong on it. Brock Purdy is probably a little bit better than I thought he was. I just, Saw a lot of dumb quarterback play from him at Iowa State. Uh, we don't need to overcorrect, though. Like, let's still be honest. Brock Purdy is playing for the most talented team in the NFL and probably one of the most creative coaches, if not the most creative coach offensively. There's a lot of scheme working in his favor, uh, but he's good. He's delivering right now. He's, you know, he's playing at a high level for what they need out of him. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll wear it. I'll wear it. I just still... When that shoe drops on Brock Purdy, I'll be waiting here to say, hey, look, he's fine. He's doing he's doing well enough, but I told you so. Um, I don't think the 49ers ever win a Super Bowl with Brock Purdy as their quarterback. Just throwing that out there. So any thoughts on the Brock Purdy situation, D.Y., before we get out of here? I, I kind of told you over the weekend a few times when, when you when you said that. I I, I I applied some resistance to your take. I And... Fortunately for you, my take of Brock Purdy being pretty solid does not look good for Matt Campbell. So you can I, I use that as ammunition that Matt Campbell. Well, look, look that's that's remember, probably my remember, problem. Matt Campbell and Iowa State. Remember, everyone was like, "Man, look what he did with Iowa State. Got him to seven wins." Now you look at all those guys that he had. It's like, how do they win only win seven games? Yeah, I mean, that's twenty twenty one Iowa State might be the the most disappointing football team of all time the way things uh worked out for them if you you rip through and see just how everything went down evaluating a a roster for them look i brock purdy is clearly good he's doing fine uh he he doesn't make the dumb decisions that we saw him make at iowa state and but it's also really easy to do because it looked like i you know the 49ers had a receiver open anytime they wanted him last night but here uh Here's what was on the roster for Iowa State in 2021. Uh, this is just offensively. You have Brock Purdy as your quarterback, who is obviously quarterbacking the best team in the NFL right now. Brees Hall, who is, you know, went off yesterday. He ran for, what, like 150 yards on the Broncos or something. Uh, that's pretty good. You had Xavier Hutchinson catching passes. That's that's pretty good. He, you know, He's in the NFL now. You had Charlie Kohler at tight end. He's in the NFL right now. You had all these guys that were that are playing in the NFL and doing it at a high level, and they still, for whatever reason, uh, weren't able to come up with uh, anything more special than seven and five. Pretty, pretty sure they had a first team All Big Twelve linebacker as yep. well, a first round defensive end, and Will yep. McDonald, a first team All first team All Big Twelve defensive back, I believe, too. Um, just a litany of, you know. Talented players that they underachieved with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not not great for Matt Campbell. And honestly, that's probably it. Like, uh, look, I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I have a strong bias towards Iowa State because I do think that they, they have a lot of fraudulent things in their past. But it's clear that Matt Campbell was putting a ceiling on the, the, the talent and performance of Brock Purdy, who is performing very well. He is performing – like a top 10 quarterback in the league right now. The stats would indicate that. I think the talent is below <laughs> top 10. I think it's probably somewhere uh, in like the, the 15 to 20 range, but he's, he's in a great system for it. I, I just, my whole, my whole point is 
Brock Purdy, yes, he is better than I thought, so I was wrong there. But there are a lot of other quarterbacks around the NFL that would be matching what he's doing right now with San Francisco. And I will also admit that one of the guys that would not be matching it right now is the quarterback of my team, Dak Prescott, because I think we saw his career end last night. That's It's official. He's, he's fallen off the cliff. His decision-making is putrid. Honestly, he's making decisions like Brock Purdy at Iowa State right now. Dak Prescott is playing like what I thought Brock Purdy would play like if he was on an NFL roster. So I hope that makes everybody happy that I've repented my sins for talking bad about a Cyclone quarterback. I can't believe you all want to defend him, uh, but I guess in the end it just means we get to laugh at Matt Campbell. So uh, we can all we can all win there. That'll do it for D.Y. and I. Again, we are back on Wednesday morning with our thoughts from Chris Kleiman's press conference, and be sure to catch that on the K-State Online YouTube tomorrow. Subscribe, turn on the notifications, make sure you get it the second it becomes available, and uh, you can watch it back and get the thoughts from K-State's head coach, as well as the player breakout interviews that will take place afterwards as well.